quite well doing. Okay, yeah, you can start. Hi. Uh, so yeah, I'm here today to talk to you about um, one half of my PhD thesis, which I defended earlier this summer, which is uh, about invariance of structures. That's a pretty vague title, but I have uh, something quite specific <laughs> to tell you about. So uh, let me let me uh, get over to the next slide here. Okay. So uh, summary of what I'm going to be talking about is that uh, first I'm actually going to tell a little bit of a story about the Burbaki group and the notion of mathematical structure that they introduced and uh, actually failed to use in their textbook series. Uh, then I'm going to give a brief summary of my thesis results and then talk in a little more detail about isomorphism invariant polynomials uh, for uh, categories of finite structures. And I will define what that means since, uh, again, that's a pretty, a pretty vague term. And uh, for what it's worth, I probably wouldn't have called these things structures if they weren't actually uh, categorification of Burbaki's structures. <laughs> it's a little presumptuous. So, uh, so first of all, um, and I only speak French a little bit, so I'm, I don't know if I'm going to try to pronounce things because it will be atrocious. Uh, <laughs> in writing the uh, Elements of Math uh, textbook series, uh, Rebecca actually wanted to uh, lay out a notion of uh, mathematical structure in the, their set theory textbook, the first textbook in the series, that they said explicitly would be used throughout the entire series as sort of this foundational concept. And uh, they, um, it turns out that they, they didn't end up doing this. Uh, so basically, it was a little more involved in this, and they had um, actually more than one base set or universe and all of these like echelon construction schemes and complex stuff. But basically what they were saying was that if we have some underlying set A, some universe of elements A, then uh, a structure is such a set equipped with an indexed family of relations. And to them, a relation was a subset of any set that could be constructed by um, taking that underlying set A and um, taking finite Cartesian products and power sets and composing those operations finitely many times. So, um, for example, a relation on A might be a subset of the direct product of A with, uh, I'm using SB for the power set, like sub, uh, and so like subset of subsets of A, uh, direct product with the 57th power of A, uh, you know, the Groton heat crime and <laughs> so on and so forth, right? And so uh, the reason that they wanted this, essentially, was that at the very least, uh, the notion of mathematical structure should encompass algebraic structures, order structures, and while well, there's no problem in doing those in the traditional model theoretic framework that encompasses graphs and pusher complexes and so forth, uh, but they wanted to do things, um, they wanted to do things like uh, talk about topologies, and in order to do that in a systematic way, you want to be able to talk about families of subsets. So you needed this other operator, and then they, of course, wanted to talk about more involved things as well that were built from these basic notions. So for this reason, uh, they needed a more involved notion of structure than later what became, or of relation, than later what became the notion of relation in model theory, just an n relation. So, uh, so yeah, Brubecki defined what we would now call morphisms of these structures in their set theory textbook, and they proved a bunch of uh, results, all of which we now would consider to be results of category theory. They um, proved results uh, relating to decomposition of morphisms. Um, they showed that you know there might be some things that were like initial or terminal objects or certain universal properties, but all of the things that they proved, even though they were in this setting, were essentially results of category theory. And it didn't have much to do with the particular notion of structure that they had introduced. So, uh, so in the course of this, Eilenberg and McLean had introduced categories as this tool in algebraic topology, and uh, it was realized that this was a very big idea and very significant uh, kind of foundational idea that was competing with the existing notion of structures that the group had introduced. So, uh, Groton, Deek, and then Cartier were asked to produce a category theory. Um, fascicule or component for the elements, and um, if either one ever wrote it, it never made it into the text. So uh, there was some some difficulty here. And basically, uh, discussions in uh, La Tribu, uh, the internal newsletter for the Burbaki group during the 50s, uh, 
indicate that, um, so Burbaki basically felt that the elements needed to be redone in terms of category theory, since that was the appropriate, seemed to be becoming the, seemed to be becoming the appropriate foundation. Uh, do you have an issue with that? Yeah, I think, you, you, can you try to mute yourself actually, because it's probably, uh, the, the, because uh, people on Zoom actually cannot hear us this voice. Um, oh, oh, like better. I, so I, I can't, I'm not even using my computer audio right now, so, yeah, are, you, so that's, are you muted? Yeah, because because I think uh, I am connected to this, uh, the, 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 I'm connected to this microphone over here, so, but then, but, but because, yeah, uh, okay, so your computer is actually not, it's not, there, there is no connection to the audio at this moment, right? Yes, that's correct. Okay. But we should still be able to hear other people speaking at the same time as I'm sharing my screen. That doesn't, like, make me take over the whole thing. Yeah, but uh, there are people on Zoom. Yeah, let, me, let me double check if people on Zoom can hear it. Actually. Okay. Point. Yes. Okay. Yeah, you may be All right. So, uh, I guess it's good I'm sharing my slides on Zoom. Uh, so, discussions in this newsletter seem to indicate that they wanted to just redo everything in terms of category theory. Um, besides the fact that that was a lot of work, it also seemed to be difficult to synthesize these uh, their original structural viewpoint in terms of their definition of mathematical structure and uh, the category theory viewpoint together. Um, so it turned out that they just decided this task wasn't worth the effort and they would just essentially leave structures in the first textbook and then ignore that they had said this was an important foundational concept in all of the textbooks that followed. Uh, and I think I remember reading that Grotendieck was quite upset that this wasn't able to be resolved. Um, so, uh, Okay, so now for my thesis results. Um, so one in one half of my thesis, I present one possible categorification of Rebecca's notion of structure. Uh, so this isn't, you know, to say that they couldn't have done this, or I'm not really saying it's like that, you know, profound. They just decided it wasn't worth the effort. And there, there is some effort involved in formalizing uh, some notion that combines, you know, category theory with their notion of structure. Uh, and so the main result that I have is a generalization of the results of Hilbert on uh, symmetric polynomials um, to the setting of finite structures. And so uh, one implication of this generalization is that if you have any um, finite structure that you're looking at, like a finite graph or a finite topological space, then any first order property that you would want to write down uh, can essentially be checked uh, whether or not it holds by counting the number of small substructures inside of the one in question. So, for example, you can test um, whatever property you want of graphs by counting the number of, say, chains of length 2 or cliques of size 5 or whatever, what have you. And if you count these, then you can determine the property um, just by performing, you know, uh, algebraic operations on these quantities. And, uh, and uh, the Meaning of small is basically that there's a direct relationship between how logically complex the formula is and the size of the pieces that you need to count. So checking something like connectivity of a graph is very logically complex in the sense that uh, you need to check very large pieces of the graph in order to, to, to determine if it is connected. But there are many properties uh, like checking whether binary operation is associative that only require you to count relatively small pieces of the, the structure in question. So um, yeah, the setup uh, the setup for this is a little involved and actually relegated to an appendix. And so I'm I'm going to do uh, in this talk basically what I had done in um, when I gave a talk for this for my defense is that I'll basically just say um, sort of the model theory version of this or more like slightly more trivial version of this uh, where all of your relations are any relations and I'll give exa I'll give examples of what that looks like. But actually the setup is quite general and um, can apply to things like finite topological spaces or, or um, other things as well. Uh, so um, the appendix also has this, uh, you need a style embedding theorem. Yeah. Is it appropriate to ask questions I can look to? Yeah, sure, you can ask questions. How does the uh, broad uh, outline that you studied uh, fit in with topics theory? So, uh, <laughs> So actually, I'm a fan of category theory. I'm even organizing an applied category theory um, some, or special session at the joint meetings in the winter. But I will admit, I'm actually not like super experienced with, um, with Topoi. 
I have started to get a little more into categorical logic, and I do think that some of the notions that I actually need to use um, are very related. But I, in my thesis, I literally just say like the exact categorical conditions that I need. But it does look like I'm approaching something that's essentially saying like I want like maybe an elementary topos or something in which I can do the usual logical operations. So, um, so I'm, I'm getting there. Uh, in you know, in, I know nothing yeah. about any of this, so I was curious because I hear all of these big issues bandied uh, about whenever the discussion approaches it. And I wish I knew more. Yeah, thanks for the question. So yeah, I, I wish I wish I could give a more detailed answer at this time. Um, but yeah, I do believe that. I mean, this is one reason that I've started to move in a slightly more categorical logic direction. Um, but yeah, so I do believe that there is, you know, that is maybe the appropriate setting. I'm just not quite there yet. I even, I, it's a little embarrassing to say that because I even went to the Topos Institute a couple of weeks ago. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting there. Um, but thanks for the question. And yeah, feel free to ask questions if you have any. Oh yeah. So the last thing is that um, it, the this appendix also has a Unita style embedding theorem, which uh, basically says something along the lines of, well. If you have any, uh, if you have any category of structures that are built out of um, out of uh, sets or what I call an exponential subcategory of sets, which has exponential objects or like internal hum, right, and and um, is closed under taking subsets, subobjects, which sounds again pretty similar to some of the notions from, you know, some of the the usual categories that you would like to work with in categorical logic, right. Um, if you have such a category that your structures are built from, then actually you can um, bump up the Yoneda embedding to saying that, well, actually you can view any structure, even if it's something like uh, topological spaces or something that's not traditionally relational in like the any relation sense, you can actually view any such category as being a category of structures that only have any area relations as their basic relations, like in the sense of model theory, and the trade-off, because then you would say, well, why would I study this at all if, like, the result is just then that, like, everything is equivalent to, to one of those or everything in the sense that I'll be talking about. And the answer is basically that in the result about um, invariance or elementary symmetric polynomials that I'm going to give, I actually need to use the finiteness of the collection of basic relations. So the trade-off is that you can view any structure in the sense that I'll describe as a structure built out of these just n area relations in the sense of model theory, but the trade off is that you'll need a proper class of them in general. You won't be able to capture the data of the, the category that you're interested in using n area relations if you only allow finitely many. And so, being able to be presented with only finitely many basic relations in like the Bourbaki style generalized sense actually can be relevant in proving combinatorial. <laughs> properties of these objects. So it's, it's not uh, totally pointless to make this generalization. It has a real, you know, concrete combinatorial effect. Okay, but um, I won't get too much into that, but I just wanted to, to throw it out there. Um, okay, so again, I'm going to start by introducing sort of the, the um, like more trivial model theoretic setup, but I'll maybe mention um, Maybe I'll just mention, and I can give um, more examples if we get to that point. But I'll, I'll just mention um, what the general the general situation is. So, um, so one definition of a finite structure is that we have a set and a sequence of just n area operations or row of i area operations, where this uh, row of i is just telling us the the arity of the operation. Um, right. So, for example. Um, you know, row of i might be two, and then you have a binary relation, and you represent things like graphs, directed graphs, and so forth. Um, and so, uh, this is basically the standard model theory setup. But again, the categorification I have has this is a special case, and it can also treat things like finite topological spaces where the relations aren't just any relations. And so, I'm going to uh, write um, struct row to indicate the uh, the evident category. Um, where morphisms are induced um, by maps from um, uh, by maps of the underlying sets, and they have to respect the structure in like the sort of natural way that morphisms of graphs or algebraic structures or um, simplicial complexes or whatever would have to respect. Uh, and there is indeed a general set. Yeah. So about the morphisms, um, so if you define a function as a function, 
have been using most of the models that is just a function to preserve the relation. So if you want to preserve the dependence of function, then the corresponding notion of the relation property is a strong homomorphism. Okay. So does it matter if we think of the f values as relations? In order to find them as a set of relations and um, functions, so does it matter to treat the functions of relations from how we define the homomorphism? Um, just yeah, just treating functions as relations is what um, mm -hmm. basically what I'm basically what I'm doing here. Okay, and what is you just preserving the relation, not preserving the relation? Yeah, just just pre just preserving, preserving okay. just preserving the relation. But that does give like the usual notion of homomorphism mm -hmm. of algebra. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also, not an expert in model theory. I can state like a couple theorems, like mm -hmm. you know, uh, but that's that's the extent of my knowledge. So. Um, Okay, so, uh, right, so then um, we have, uh, so not bold struct row uh, sub A indicates all of the structures um, uh, of that signature on the same underlying set A, uh, which I'll call a kinship class. So, for example, if this row is the signature for directed graphs, this struct row sub A would be the collection of all directed graphs on the same underlying set of vertices A. And so uh, the class of all structures in signature row is likewise called the similarity class, as in universal algebra and so forth. And so, uh, okay, so I'm going to refer to a subobject of a structure as a substructure, which is perhaps a natural, natural definition. And again, this can be done in a general categorical way, where it literally is a subobject of whatever the structure is in the relevant category. Uh, so secretly, actually, uh, my categories of structures are functor categories, and this would be um, a subobject of uh, such a functor. Um, okay, so uh, we're going to um, say that some signature. Um, okay, and so here's a slightly more general definition. So I'm kind of being wishy-washy in between, like the very concrete, like model theoretic thing, and the more general thing. So if instead of, a, instead of a signature taking an index set i to the arity of the relation, we can actually view that as being a special case of a functor taking an index category i, which could be discrete, and that would just be like the index set, to a category of functors from set to itself, where, for example, the functors could be taking um, like the nth Cartesian power functor that takes a set a and gives you back a to the n, or it could be something more general, like taking a set a and giving you back the power set, or any of those Bourbaki style constructions that I mentioned before. And so we'll say that some signature is finite when this category iota or category fancy i has finitely many objects and finitely many morphisms. And so for each object uh, in, the cat in the category, in the index category in each finite set, we have that this, which is basically the corresponding relation on that set for that um, object in the index category. So in other words, that basic relation is finite. So for example, if we're talking about like taking the power set functor, that would be a finite signature because uh, one of these guys would be, for example, like the set of all subsets of A. But um, if A is finite, then this is also finite and that's good. That's what we want. Okay, so that's a mention of the slightly more general setup. And then um, if we have a finite signature and a finite set, then this kinship class is finite, literally in the sense that there are only finitely many directed graphs on a finite set of vertices. We only allow one edge per pair of vertices, one directed edge. Um, or similarly, for finite topological spaces, there are only finitely many finite topological spaces on a finite set. And so, uh, so now uh, I'm going to talk about polynomials. And so if we have a set of variables, um, then, of course, the symmetric group acts as permutations and, and in turn acts on the corresponding um, algebra over commutative ring R generated by those variables. And so uh, the polynomials that are invariant under this action are the symmetric polynomials. And there's this classical result of Hilbert that um, certain very simple so-called elementary symmetric polynomials uh, generate this algebra of all symmetric polynomials. And so, uh, okay, so I hope that that's, is that familiar to people? Like that's like a pretty, okay. So, um, all right. So uh, first of all, um, I'm going to define a monomial for any um, 
for any given uh, structure in this kinship class. So if I have, um, for example, a particular directed graph in mind on a finite set A of vertices, then I'm going to define this monomial. So this bold A, this is a bold A, is like, say, my finite graph. The monomial associated to that graph is, well, this product would be over all of the basic relations in my structure. So say it would just be a single basic relation, the relation in the graph of adjacency. And then this product is over, um, this product is over all, um, all possible edges that are actually in that basic relation. And so what I'm saying here is just that you have these variables X and A, which is just saying like either the edge is in the graph or the edge is not in the graph. In other words, these are the structure constants or the entries of the uh, adjacency matrix of the graph. But this is like a, a general construction that you can perform anytime you have this categorical presentation of what a structure is. You can talk about having these structure constants either a particular edge or face or subset is in the relation or it's not and these variables are representing whether or not that's the case and so the product of all variables corresponding to all of the edges in a particular graph we can view it as a monomial associated to that particular graph and there will be a distinct monomial for each for each possible structure on that set and you can think of that if we actually were to evaluate it as giving us a test that either says, yes, this is the graph in question or no, it's not, or yes, this is the structure in question or no, it's not. Because um, if we think about zero and one as being Boolean yes and no, right? This is kind of just saying uh, this first edge is in the graph and the second edge is in the graph and blah, 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 right? So, okay, are there any questions? I, I'm hesitant to do examples until I actually get to the statement of the thing because I only have 40 minutes, I believe. So, yes. uh, okay. So then if we have any finite signature, as I described before, um, some finite set A, there's a corresponding polynomial algebra over the underlying ring, just some commutative unit ring, but usually we take the integers, say. And uh, we take that to be the subalgebra of uh, the algebra that's freely generated by these structure constant variables, like the entries in the adjacency matrix, uh, which is generated by those um, by those uh, monomials that represent the individual structures. Uh, so um, we denote this by the um, by pole row A R. So the um, so that's the polynomial algebra for over R for the signature on the set. Um, and its universe is the not old one. So we have a natural group action, which I've written down explicitly here, but basically um, since uh, if you imagine like for a graph, permuting the uh, vertices of the graph induces a permutation of the entries in the adjacency matrix. And so you can extend that action to the individual variables that I said were like the structure constant variables. And then that in turn induces a permutation of the monomials I defined before, because of course, permuting, permuting the vertices of, of the graph um, permutes around all of the graphs that have those vertices, right? So that's the action there. And then a symmetric polynomial is a poly polynomial that's invariant under that action. And so, um, you know, or that's fixed by that action. So then uh, we have uh, this generalization of, of Hilbert setup or in the case of Hilbert, we would have actually a single unary relation, which would just be specifying a subset of our underlying set A, and uh, the symmetric polynomials, the structure constants would just be like essentially x1, x2, x3, up through xn, that would be like the n elements of A, telling us yes or no in elements in our subset, and then a symmetric polynomial in this sense is literally a symmetric polynomial in the classical sense. So this is a, a straight generalization. So, uh, okay, so then we have, um, okay, so then we have a group action on um, the set of, uh, the set of structures, right, um, by, if we have an implementation of A again, and so here this, this is coming from the slightly more <laughs> categorified setup, but this is sort of the, the proper notion is that we have this monomorphism representing a subobject of our general, generalized setup for relations, and then um, this rho sigma is the corresponding induced map, but again, 
just keep picturing the graph case and you'll be good. Um, so then, of course, we have, uh, we can look at the set of all isomorphism classes of structures of a given signature on a finite set. So for if this was graphs on a, you know, set with five elements, then this would be like just the isomorphism classes of all graphs of order five. Same directed graphs in the And so then, uh, well, an elementary symmetric polynomial is we choose one of these isomorphism classes, and then we, uh, and then what we do is we take all of the all of the structures that are in that isomorphism class and just add up their their uh, their corresponding monomials, right? And so this thing logically is just saying like, is your structure is your structure a copy of of this you know this isomorphic copy of your graph or this one or this one or this one, right? And so. Uh, and so, yeah, these are um, these are symmetric polynomials. It you know takes a little calculation, but they are, which is good. And so, uh, so the theorem, which again is a direct generalization of Hilbert's theorem, is that if you have a polynomial, a symmetric polynomial uh, of some degree d, then there exists a polynomial um, just in the um, just in the the z is just a new variable. So there just exists some polynomial in the, um, essentially in the, the same set of basic variables as you had for the uh, signature over that given set, there's some polynomial G of weight at most D, the weight is basically the, the size of the individual monomials or the size of the structures that you have to count. In other words, that's where the smallness and the small structure statement that I made before comes from. So that F is actually that polynomial G uh, where you just plug in for each of these variables, the elementary symmetric um, polynomial corresponding to that variable. Okay. So I well, okay, I guess what I meant was that these these guys are supposed to be in correspondence with these, but of course, you know, I want you to separate them out to talk about like polynomials and this generic polynomial algebra into which I could plug in the elementary symmetric polynomials. Um, okay. And so yeah, so this is um, this is basically saying that you know if you have some um, if you're looking at finite graphs on some particular finite set, then you can, um, you know, you can look at an elementary symmetric polynomial in terms of their structure constants or those monomials that are counting um, which isomorphic, you know, whether you have a particular copy of some graph on that set. And then if you have one that's symmetric, that's an isomorphism invariant one, then actually you can always represent that as just some polynomial in terms of the counts of copies of the individual graphs in there. And so this can be pretty not obvious that it's the case if you look at particular examples, like it's not necessarily obvious if you just write down some polynomial in the individual structure constants that actually it has to be, it has to be expressible in this, in this form. Um, but it turns out, it turns out that it does. Uh, okay. So are there any questions kind of about the basic statement? Um, I know I know I give examples if I had more time and I will when I pub when I publish this in a journal I haven't published it. Yeah, I've just defended my dissertation. Um, so uh, the reason I said like any first order property is that um, there's some finagling, but you can essentially represent any first order property of finite structures by um, by counting witnesses to some logical formula. And so you can actually turn any formula that you want into a corresponding polynomial or family of polynomials. And then those polynomials will all be elementary symmetric ones that can be, that can be uh, represented in this way. And so there, there is like an explicit way to do that. Okay, so, all right, so the proof is inductive and it does follow a proof of uh, Hilbert's result. I think the one that's in Lang is this one. And so um, there are some additional things that we have to do in order to get this. So uh, first of all, we actually have to show that monomials factor as um, taking, uh, if you take a product of monomials, then you can actually represent that as a single monomial whose corresponding structure is the join of all of the individual structures AI in the post set of structures on the finite set. Um, so this you know, would be like the union of the, the graphs if we were talking about graphs, uh, times some polynomial, which is just some polynomial in this polynomial algebra. 
but we don't necessarily, it's not necessarily symmetric or anything. It's just some, some polynomial that is in this polynomial algebra. And so then we induct on the size of the universe A. And so uh, we suppose that we have the result, including the statement about the weight for um, a set with one fewer elements. And then uh, what we do is we say uh, this, we take this A sub N, big A sub N, is the collection of all the variables or all of the structure constants, like you know, entries in the adjacency matrix or so forth, that uh, depend on this variable. So like if it was for graphs, we'd be saying, well, if we have it for graphs of size n plus one, then this would be like the collection of all entries in the adjacency matrix, which represent an edge that involves an, either a loop on an or an edge between an and something else. And so uh, if we take our symmetric polynomial f that we have, and we zero out all of the, the entries that would correspond to the new vertex or the new underlying element, then we get a symmetric polynomial in the set that's one smaller. And so then there's some G1 in this, uh, you know, in this ring that's generated by these representatives for the symmetric polynomials, these variables that correspond to the symmetric polynomials of weight at most D, so that if we take that restricted polynomial where we dropped all of the, all of the terms that had the, the new element in them, then it is this G1 uh, evaluated on the elementary symmetrics for the set that's one smaller. And so then basically we want to try to kick this up into being a, a, an expression in terms of a different G1 for the elementary symmetrics for the, the next size up, right? So um, the conclusion is basically that we take the difference between that G1 evaluated on the elementary symmetrics for um, for a, not for the, the smaller, not for the smaller algebra. Okay, it's not truly that G1. We have to uh, we have to lift it by the canonical inclusion of like a a1 up through am minus one into a1 through am. But we can do that. So this is like a lifting of the polynomial we had before. We evaluate it on these elementary symmetrics, and then we basically have to show that the difference between this f that we started with and this G1 is is a new polynomial that can be expressed in the same way, that it's some, some G2 applied to the same elementary symmetrics. And so this argument does largely parallel the, the uh, one of the arguments uh, for Hilbert's uh, for Hilbert's result. So um, I'm not gonna not gonna do the details since I have perhaps five minutes left. Uh, okay, so not thank you quite yet because okay now that I do have a, I do have a little bit of time um, I thought that maybe I would write down some specific examples since you were all very patient with me and like let me go through like the abstraction without actually writing down examples. Uh, so let me stop sharing my screen. Okay, so um, hopefully, oh yeah, and then can can you pin yourself? I think, in? Uh, I think you can write over here. So this part is completely captured by uh, by by by, yeah, by, by, the, by your camera. Okay. Yeah. All right. Then I don't have to put the screen up. Let's see how this marker does. Do I have an eraser? Oh, okay. So actually, I'm use black instead of probably another. So, um, so first of all, uh, in the the case where we just have a single a single relation, so like what what is? Uh, but this is not good actually. So you, yeah, this is this cannot be seen. You can use this one. Oh, okay. Okay. Well. Yeah, this this works. Uh, okay, so um, so right, so in uh, in in Hilbert's in Hilbert's case, um, uh, what is the what is the corresponding what is the corresponding notion of structure? I mean, he didn't say it this way, but basically, we have a set A, and then we have some basic relation that I'll just call F, and F it, at little F is just a subset, a subset of A, right? So if um, if A is the set, you know, uh, let's say A1, A2, A3, then we have um, we have an elementary symmetric polynomial, uh, which I'll call, I guess, S of, um, let's say, A1, A2. And this is going to look like a sum of all of the monomials representing isomorphic copies of the set A1, A2 under the action of permutations of A. So this is just well, what we would probably 
I mean, we could write it slightly differently. If I wrote it in more of the notation I've been using, it would be, you know, something along the lines of like x f a one x f a two. But of course, we usually just call this x one and x two um, because there isn't more going on. Plus x f, you know, a one x f a three plus x f a two x f a three. Okay, and so those are all the two element subsets, in other words, of the set um, of the set A. So this would be the elementary symmetric polynomial for. Well, okay, I guess I really should have said I really should have said the uh, isomorphism class. of a1, a2. And so for example, this, this guy here would be what I called y. So something like y, a1, a2. Because in this case, the structure constants are just telling us, yes, an element is in the set or no, it's not. So are there any questions about this? And this is just usually what's called like, you know, like S2, like the second elementary symmetric polynomial. Um, okay, so then in the more general setup, I'll just say, well, now instead, if we consider something like uh, a set A equipped with this relation F, which is a subset of A squared, then, uh, for instance, no, I think that your pen, the pen is still dying, actually, oh, okay. so yeah, I think this one is better. All right, thank you. Yeah. yeah. So then, uh, in this case, we could say, like, well, you know, let's uh, a particular monomial. Uh, let's say A is again set A one, A two, A three, and so um, a particular monomial. Um, well, let's say that let's say that G is um, let's say that G is the uh, cycle, the three order, the, the directed three cycle on A one, A two, and A three. So then, like Y G would be just x, say, f, uh, a1, a2 as an ordered pair, x, f, a2, a3, x, f, a3, a1. And then, and then uh, the corresponding, OK, so the corresponding symmetric polynomial for um, isomorphism class of g so this is what I called like S little S psi before. This would be like, you know, Y G plus maybe I'll just like write like Y, you know, Y sigma G plus Y sigma squared G, where this, you know, sigma sigma is just the, you know, the permutation, right? Um Oh, sorry. I, I needed to. I needed. Okay. I need actually the whole. I need actually the whole. Uh, nah, maybe I won't do that. I, I don't just need. I don't don't just need that one permutation. I need the whole symmetric group on three letters. So there 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 are six there are six of them. Because I forgot about the, the swap. So I'll just I'll just write it like I'll just write it like this since there's um. Oh, actually no. Nope, I'm I'm being ridiculous now. Sorry. Uh, so we want only the different isomorphic copies. And so if we permute A1, A2, and A3, we get the same thing. So then the only possibility is that we reverse the orientation. That's the only other way to get an isomorphic copy. So what I actually want to say is it's that YG plus um, Y tau G, where tau is, um, well, yeah, maybe I'll just write it out. It's, 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 why G odd? It's, 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 it's G with the opposite ordering. That's what I mean, right? There's only two isomorphic copies of this under the action. Um, either, you know, if you, the only permutations that would, that would, um, yeah, the only permutations that would give you a different isomorphic copy of this, since it's symmetric already, like in the sense that you can commute A1, A2, and A3, would be if we, if we reversed, um, if we reverse the, the ordering, um, because then that would still be an isomorphic copy of the of the graph. Yeah, so that would 
Yeah, but and that's you... bothering. Actually, that's bothering. That's bothering me as well now. Yeah, yeah, because if you reverse the ordering, I think that's actually so the direction is also changes, right? So. Yeah, I feel like I feel like that's actually bothering bothering me about like what I mean by that now. So I do I I let's see. So it should it should just be all of the yeah. I guess maybe maybe what's maybe what's bad is I just chose I just chose something that doesn't have. Uh, well, no relabeling. Yeah, relabeling the vertices. Right. I just I feel like that should be totally. It should just be the picture of the graph and should be totally independent. But I guess by isomorphic copies, I mean. Okay, so this was a bad example. A good example would be like just doing this instead, and then I would say like you know it's it's all of the it's all of the graphs that look like you know it's all of the graphs that look like chains of length too. So this would be like you know some of uh, chains of length too. All right, sorry I I biffed it a little bit here at the end, but um, I will have a paper out soon with like lots of like more detailed examples and you know. I just, off the top of my head this morning, I just chose a bad example. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, yeah, I mean, that's definitely my time, so thank you very much. Um, all okay, right, yeah. let's have the speaker. Okay, I shall stop the recording and then we, maybe I can actually we can ask questions.